Yes, I first of all wanted to thank Jack to have brought me here all the way from Germany. I also would like to thank Andrea and Andrew who drove me around. I might as well admit at this point that I don't have a driving license, license which made me feel like a complete alien in Los Angeles and I, I promise that I'll make it when I'm back in Berlin. Uh, my talk will be a bit of a spoiler because I actually won't talk about the artists in the show. I decided to address the return of the human figure as a problem. As a problem that is somewhat related, I think, to a new economy which aims squarely at our human resources. And I also want to relate uh, those suggestions of liveliness that we find in works that kind of reactivate the human figure, I want to relate these suggestions of liveliness also to the value form, to questions of value. Um, the images I'll show, I won't do justice to the artworks I'm showing, they just function as footnotes. And the two artists I'm going to focus upon are Isa Gensken and Rachel Harrison, by way of example. I've recently proposed, actually in a text in Art Forum, that there is a return to the human figure in much recent <coughs> sculpture. In many cases, it is the rhetorics of minimalism that are mobilized in order to suggest the presence of an absent person. In the case of Isa Genskens and Rachel Harrison's works, for example, this return of the human figure takes on particular resonance. They often appear either as mistreated dolls, tattered mannequins, or amorphous entities. While it is once again the rhetorics of minimalism that are mobilized in these works, I would argue that they often suggest the presence of what I call a quasi-subject. By quasi-subject, I mean that they evoke the mental states of a self-conscious being. Quasi-subjects can assume the shape of human figure, but they are modeled on the concept of the subject, a concept which is a modern invention. Comparable to the subject, which was supposed to be able to rule and to dominate, the quasi-subject imposes itself and, and appears to behave or to act. Here, an amorphous quasi-subject is seemingly vacuum cleaning. Now, I'm aware of the semantic proximity between my quasi-subjects and Bruno Latour's recourse to quasi-objects, which also blur the line between living and non-living entities. The difference is one of emphasis. While Latour's quasi-objects are hybrids, profoundly conflating subject and object into one, I want to maintain a notion of difference when arguing that some quasi-subjects pose, act or present themselves like subjects. In the case of Gensken and Harrison, I've argued that their assemblages produce a sense of subjecthood that delivers precisely the kind of subjectivity that has emerged as a resource in the new current economy. I will propose to read them in two ways as suppliers of a subjectivity that the current economy is busy absorbing and as allegories of a damaged subject. Now, the idea that artworks could be constituted in analogy to living subjects was anathema to modernist critics like Michael Fried, we just heard that, who insisted that art transcends subjectivity. In his essay, already mentioned by him once again, art and objecthood, uh, he had detected, I quote, a kind of latent or hidden anthropomorphism at the heart of minimalist sculpture, something he, as you know, criticized. Now, I've argued elsewhere that the objecthood in Fried's essay was actually a subjecthood in disguise. Consider how Fried compared the, I quote, obtrusiveness, even aggressiveness, of works by Donald Judd or Robert Morris 
to the feeling of being, I quote, distanced or crowded by the silent presence of another person. One could say that it is the behavior of these works that he disliked. They reminded him, how, they reminded him of how it feels to be bothered by someone occupying the same literal space. It took years until the French art historian Georges Didier Huberman rehabilitated the basically anthropomorphic nature of minimal art. Huberman went so far as to praise the fact that Judd's non-relational specific objects suddenly mutate into a subject due to their direct and powerful appearance on the scene. While Fried resented the fact that these objects seek out confrontation with the viewer, Didi Übermann credited them for engaging the viewer due to their body size and the emphasis on interactivity. Um, my problem with the anthropomorphism in the minimalist works of the present is of a different kind. I first of all think that we need to distinguish between an anthropomorphism that invites us to read the traits of a human being into a non-human thing, like in Gensken or Harrison, or an anthropomorphism that literally presents replicas of the human figure, like Charles Ray's work. As much as I don't share Fried's phobic rejection of the interactive dimension of artworks, I find the emphasis on liveliness by Didi Übermann not less problematic, because it is one thing to note that artworks act like subject, and another to declare them like Didi Übermann does, as subjects because this not only obscures their material origin, but moreover it downplays the projection activity of the viewer. I would prefer to discuss the subjecthood of artworks as a problem, particularly in view of a new economy that takes aim at subjectivity as a potential resource. Now there have been several attempts in the social sciences to characterize this new economy that I've been referring to. It has been named either post-Fordism, neoliberalism or cognitive capitalism, to name but a few of the popular terms. The central feature of this new economy is seen to be the fact that it aims squarely at our human resources, seeking to exploit not only our bodies but also our affects and desires. What the new form of capitalism is after is life itself. For me, it is the recent resurgence of mannequins in many artworks which points to this contemporary sense of a contested subjecthood. We can detect mannequins not only in Genskens and Harrison's assemblages, see for example Genskens Straßenfest or Harrison's Alexander the Great, but we can see the mannequin in other artworks as well. I just refer to a few of them, Heimo Zobernik's Untitled, David Lieske's Imperium in Imperio, or Thomas Hirschhorn's Crystal of Resistance, his work for the Swiss Bi Pavilion in the 2011 Venice Biennial, to name but a few. This anthropomorphic turn is also emblematic of life under the conditions of celebrity culture, where products become persons and persons get commodified. As soon as a mannequin appears in an art display, we are met with a commodified quasi-person. The strange, this strange amalgamation strikingly maintains the difference between product and person while symbolically also collapsing it. These surrogates thus reveal the embattled subjectivity at the heart of what Luc Boltanski and Yves Chiappello have famously called the new spirit of capitalism, which demands the exploitation not only of labor, but also of personality, emotions, social relations, and other non-economic aspects of our individual lives. <coughs> Rather than insisting that on the possibility that art could be an anti-subjective or even purely epistemological activity, and this is a notion of art I would like to hold on to, these works cannot escape being simultaneously both lifeless and seemingly alive. In other words, 
faced with a new power technology that aims at the fabrication of our subjectivities, these works deliver the resource most in demand. Only we can, of course, now discuss whether these types of works are reflecting what is most wanted, whether they are exaggerating a current desire, or whether they are simply satisfying it. Perhaps, and this is the best case scenario, perhaps they manage to do all these things in the same time. But if we also remember that value presupposes lived labor, and this is how Marx described value as founded in lived labor, that there is no value, in other words, without the suggestion of aliveness, then it makes sense, I think, to establish a connection bet between the appearance of animation in these works, which re reactivate the human figure, and their value form. I think that the more alive a work of art seems to be, the more likely it will be that it will be considered to possess value. Value, not in the sense of price, value in the sense of an aesthetic and e economic worth, a merit that it has in our new economy. Thank you. <laughs>